Thank you, Mike. Finally, music. I can understand the words. All right. Do you notice that uh, when Travis was giving the charge, I think he, when he got to the passage where they said, even when you're old and gray, and how many people shouted in this room? That's a good, healthy thing, all right? Might be amusing for the uh, younger generation, but... Uh, that's a great thing. Hallelujah. You guys are setting the bar really high, okay, in terms of your expression, your expectation, your faith. So you know what we need to do? We need to fill this place up with millennials and younger that they can receive and see the demonstration of the Spirit of God modeled in your life. Amen? So God give us the strategy to do that. Amen. All right. Let's take your Bible, if you would. We're going to make this declaration. This covenant word will guide my life and open up my destiny. This word sets a bright path in front of me. By this word, I'm established in truth, righteousness, justice, and holiness. This word is the Magna Carta and constitution of Christ's kingdom. I can live by it, I can prosper in it, and I am secured by it. This word is forever settled in heaven, and today it's changing my life. Lord, out of that confession this morning, we ask, Lord, that our hearts would be open to your word. We ask, Lord, that our, our spirit man would be engaged in what, Holy Spirit, you are speaking to us today as we've already been in this time of worship. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful exhortation of giving this morning and, and how that open hearts connect with you and, and just uh, remain joyful all through our lives. So we thank you for that. And, Lord, we just give this time to you. We thank you for clarity and the connection that's needed in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm excited about sharing this morning and uh, thank you for uh, being a willing and vibrant audience. Okay. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is share something out of uh, Give Him 15 and now let me grab one more thing here and you turn it on. And you activate it, and there you go. Give Him 15 is a, uh, a devotional app that you can download either on your computer or your phone. And uh, Dutch Sheets, who's part of our FMCI network of churches, uh, he is the one that hosts that. He's not always the one that's the contributor on it, but those that he associates with are. It's very timely. In fact, this morning, as I read it, he was sharing the fact that there are major groups that have been praying these last, yesterday and today, uh, regarding the storm and prophesying and speaking and declaring into it. And uh, I think that's what the body of Christ needs to do when they... When, it's, when they see things on the horizon to engage, amen? Not just in natural storms, but all the other storms as well. So I wanted to read because um, his last two of this past week had to do with the same topic that I wanted to share on, and that is the topic of change. And so his part one is the changing of an era, the changing of an era. God has an order in the way he restores things. He's been restoring things to his original plan since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. That brings us to now. We are in a key place in time. We are about to end a year and a decade on the Hebrew calendar. That's God's time frame from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. We need to align with that. We are moving from 5779 to 5780. Let me pause. Mike, I'm just getting a little bit of echo going on. Maybe I'm just a little too loud or whatever. Maybe you can give me the voice of some famous person that's on the radio or something like that or... Let me, let, me, let me get back. So he's talking about from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah is when uh, the Hebrew year starts. So he says we need to align with that. We're moving from 5779 to 5780. However, the Lord is telling me we are moving into a new era for the church. We're coming out of a church era, and we are coming into an era of era of kingdom display. This will be a dimension of 10 years that we have never been in before, especially in this nation. 
We are being prepared for that. You can tell more about an era, and this is in quotes, and this I think is from Chuck Pierce at this point. You can tell more about an era when you look in it through the Hebrew calendar. The last decade has been linked to 70, uh, linked with 70, and I'll move ahead. There was, yeah, right there. Um, so I'll pop on that one for a second. The last year was 70. It's linked with the Lord watching and his eye being on the movement of what's going on in the earth. 70 is also linked to angelic hosts coming and being released. There is a divine aligning of angelic hosts with the church to align for his purposes in the earth for the future. Additionally, 70 is linked with the concept of sending. So we've been in a decade for a decade of preparing to be sent. That's very important. All 70s are linked with the Holy Spirit. So you can see the 70 in there, 5, 7, okay, and 57, 80, 5, 7, 7, 9, 57, 80. Um, it's linked. We also have the number 9 because it's 5, 7, 7, 9. 9 is linked with the Holy Spirit. It's linked to the nine gifts of the Spirit, the nine fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is moving on us in this year. We need to look and see where he's hovering. We need to watch and see how he is moving. And then the scripture verse, very important scripture verse, it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 2, 9 and 10. And let me just add, there is in each of us a life-giving spirit. Say it with me, I have a life-giving spirit. I have a life-giving spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit in us. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. I'm not just a saved Christian. I am a believer, I am a saved Christian, and the Holy Spirit dwells in me. And out of our innermost being is supposed to flow this river of life, of living water. Okay, so let's just wanted to affirm that. Oh, so on this next day, he did part two, um, the changing of an ear, part two. Faith, I'm sorry. That's right. Faith works in time and place. God predetermined our time. He predetermined our place. So when we gather together at the right time and place in the assignment of the Lord, faith explodes in us. In the last decade, God was restoring a new watchman anointing on us and refining our vision. So that's the reason you see the big eye looking at you. In the new era, beginning in 5780... Our mouth will produce. Now, let me just pause right here. Um, because in the Hebrew language, the numbers are also connected with pictures. And this ha happens to be a picture uh, of a mouth, which is the prophetic thing is why they say, we are going to see a thing and now decree a thing. And all of a sudden, it will start to happen. The healing movement is about to change. The move of God is about to change. The voice of God through us is getting ready to make decrees like we've never seen before. New cycles of blessing are about to be revealed. What you saw many years ago, now things are aligning for them to come into being in fullness. They're beginning to happen. We have been moving toward it, but now there's coming a divine alignment. When you are in the right place at the right time, he is very near you. The reason for this shift is because the harvest is beginning to break out. We have to shift out of our conventional ways of thinking. God is going to start saving some unusual individuals. Well, we have unusual individuals here. I'm part of that. So that's, that's good. We'll have lots of company. They are going to need physical, psychological, and emotional healing in some interesting areas of their lives. We're going to need to know what to do and how to minister to this harvest it won't be like before. And then the scripture, Mark 2, 17, and when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, and I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And one of the prayer points in this last one was this. He says, deal with any regret or grief you may have about the ending of the last era. 
Overcome your fear of the new. Change can be hard to deal with, but you're going to need to make this shift. So if you want to review that for yourselves, just download that app, uh, give him 15, and that's what it looks like right here. So if you see that, you'll know you have the right app. So new era and change, and so I want to talk about that because I believe um, everything is changing. Okay, And I believe we are moving from some of the things that we have been seeing to now stepping into declaring what God says about it and seeing it changed. Okay, And that's a higher level of engaging. In fact, if you just review some of the things we've seen on a national or even a political level, it's an amazing, this past 10 years, even the past three or four years, the political corruption that has been unveiled is incredible. Even the most recent thing about the sex trafficking and Jeffrey Epstein, which is, you know, he's just one person of the multitudes that are connected with that. Um, the progressive anti-Christian agenda that big corporations have. It's becoming more and more apparent that if you say certain things on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, whatever, then your account, especially if you're a major voice of conservatism, will probably be restricted or something will happen so that your voice gets diminished again. It's that Romans 1 that we talked about a few weeks ago about suppressing the truth. So we see that going on. You're hearing it more and more all the time. The explosion of opioids and the hopelessness that goes along with it, the agenda of LGBTQ, all of those things we're now seeing more and more clearly, okay? But we are to see, as Dutch said, and Dr. Don confirmed it a few weeks ago, the church needs to move from just being congregational to what was the next word he said? Congressional. Well, what does that mean? We're all going to be, you know, show up and, and take a vote on every issue? No. It means that there should be an authority that we come with. There should be that sense of the church is not the last voice in the mountains of culture. The church should be the preeminent voice because our king who owns it all, uh, Psalm 24, uh, tells us and directs our lives, okay? So, Amen. We are, we're seeing abortion, the life issue, now being powerfully challenged by the heartbeat bill and other bills like that all across the country. Something that 10 years ago we didn't think we would ever see or 20 years ago because it was so entrenched. Um, last week I ended with Genesis 32, and uh, I'm not going to repeat the whole story even though I'd be tempted to, but in that last uh, closing part of that story, we see Jacob, he's ready to meet his brother Esau, and he has what I will call, and we can call, a change encounter. Anytime you encounter God, you encounter the Spirit of God powerfully, whether it's here in worship, whether it's in another setting, no matter where it is, you will always be changed. Sometimes those changes will be more pronounced. Sometimes they're so radical that other people see Something is now different. You're about to do or say, you're, you're, you're acting, you're just different than you were. But here's Jacob, and Jacob is now on the other side of the brook, and his brother, when he left him many years ago, was quite mad and wanted to kill him. Okay, And so Jacob does his best in his mind. He plans things out. He says, okay, if I send all these gifts in advance and, and he sees all these things that, that I'm blessing him with, maybe he'll be appeased. He literally told God, I am afraid. And God, I know you've blessed me. I only crossed this Jordan with a staff and now I have all of this that you've blessed me with, but I am afraid of the future. And so Jacob now is all alone and he's empty. And we see that it's in this place where what happens? He wrestles with God, which is a great thing, and his name is changed, his identity is changed, and his whole story is all about, even from the very beginning, about these encounters where God keeps changing him along the way. 
In fact, just think about it for a minute. This whole book is about change. Everything in here is about change. There was nothing, and then God spoke the worlds into existence. That's a pretty big change. Jesus, the Son of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, became a man, Emmanuel, God with us. That's pretty big change. He was resurrected from the dead. That's pretty huge change. He ascended back into heaven at the Father's right hand, and now he's fully God, fully man at the Father's right hand. That's what I call change. So the whole book is about change, okay? So I guess I'm talking about a very wide subject. But the whole story of Jacob's life is about change. And maybe that should be our story. But So I was kind of thinking of, of Jacob in this scenario. So I did something I n rarely ever do. I wrote a po poem, okay? I used to call it poem. Then I got corrected. It's a poem. More distinguished way to say it. But I was thinking of what, was, what happened in that, that transaction with Jacob and God? He wrestled with, with God and got changed. So let me read this to you. You ready for it? It's kind of like it's the night before Christmas, so don't laugh, okay? <laughs> Only the first couple lines. It was the night before Esau and all through the clan was a lingering fear about Jacob's new plan. There in the darkness, a great struggle maintained until the coming of daybreak with the revealing of his name. His nature was hidden, yet in full view, of the God of great purpose whose brokenness he would soon undo. At the ford of Jabok came a great pouring out, the real Jacob with new honesty, and this time, no doubt. A new day ascended, and so did the man, to become God's destiny, that was always the plan. On a dusty desert plain, love finally broke through, and the nation being birthed was Israel the new. Thank you, thank you. I can also recite whose woods these are, I think I know, but I won't do that for you. But the name change of Jacob, I listened to, to a little clip of a Hebrew scholar. He said, it wasn't some blind, passive, you know, obedience that, that the nation of Israel had with God over time. It was always about this active struggle and this confrontation and this dialogue that kept changing them. Jacob, obviously, is a picture of that. So I have a few comments, and so that ascending, you know, Jacob was ascending into a brand new day. He was changed. And my first point is, all change must align us. What was God doing with Jacob? He was aligning him with his purpose. God had a purpose. He spoke it through Abraham, Isaac, and now he's dealing with Jacob, and he's going to get his purpose done, but he's using these broken people, just like you and I, to get his purpose done. So now, at this daybreak, and that word means ascend, there's a breakthrough. And what a feeling. Have you ever had a breakthrough? Raise your hand if you've ever had a breakthrough. Man, it's a great feeling, whether it's a relational, spiritual, financial Whatever it is, whether even, you know, you've run the mile faster than you ever have before, whatever it is, it's just a great feeling. But all change should align us with God's purposes. And I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I had to think, well, I've gone through some changes. In the summer of 1980, I decided I'm not going to stay in engineering, I'm going to move into theology, okay? The two somehow are just kind of like totally opposite poles. But that's what I did, and I moved 2,000 miles away, and that was God's directed, God directed change for purpose in my life. In 1993, I changed, and I, our whole family moved, and we planted a church in another city. In 1996, I changed, and I moved, and we went on sabbatical for one year in northern Maine. In 1997, I changed, and I moved to Mariota, Ohio, and now you're blessed because of that. No. <laughs> Lord help us. Okay. <laughs> Certainly not fishing for comments. Um, 
But here's an important thing that I've learned, not just from those changes. Those are just big changes, but geographical changes. We saw that with Abraham. We saw it with Moses trying to get the people through. Geographical changes are all part of that process of God in our life as well. But let me just make a couple of statements that I know, and I think I know this. If I truly change, it affects others. If I change, my wife will change. Now, I don't know if she needs to, but, you know, there's always improvement somewhere in all of us, right? If I change, my wife will change. If I change, my kids will change. You may think, well, that's a stretch. You don't. Oh, yeah, it's true. There are changes that you and I and fathers and men and spouses can make in our lives that will change our spouse, that will change our families. If I change, literally this church changes. If I change and we change together, literally the community where we live changes. It's called sphere influence. There's a sphere of influence that you have spiritually, physically, and in you know, your personality. All those kinds of things can change. Let me just give you this, and I won't even go into the whole story because Nathan tells the story beautifully. He told it back when we had our conference here in April, our FMCI conference. Change. We had, as a church, the opportunity, and we took it, to invite key leaders from around the mid-Ohio Valley to a luncheon to explore a topic about what are we going to do with the change that's taking place. Because at that time, we were just now discovering the massive amounts of oil and gas, especially the natural gas that was under our feet all this time. The treasure was there all the time. It's just a spiritual example. We could preach that one for a while. And so we, we invited all these key people. And we had, um, I guess, enough faith, and, and we invited a young prophet. We'd plowed some ground and built those relationships. We invite a young prophet who is economically just an amazing young man, but it's also the Spirit of God in him, and he planted some seeds in the ground that we had been plowing over the years because our mindset is it's not just about what we do in this room. It's about what we do in the mid-Ohio Valley. And so some seeds were planted there. Boom. All of a sudden, a tremendous marketing company was birthed out of some of those same people that were there. And those now, those, this, this company that's here in Marietta is talking to other companies that are worth billions of dollars saying, why don't you come and establish your companies in the mid-Ohio Valley because we have what you need. Change. You have sphere influence. You you can change things by the Spirit of God. So every change affects something or someone else, and that can be both positive and negative. When Abraham changed, he got out of his tent because he heard the Lord speak to him and say, go out of the earth of the Chaldees and go to where I tell you a nation was born. When Moses, he changed in front of a burning bush and a nation was delivered out of 400 years of slavery. When David was called out from the field, something changed in his life. Samuel poured oil on him and said, you're now the king. That changed things. When the disciples heard the message of Jesus and saw what he did, they said, we're changing. We're no longer fishermen, tax collectors, and everything else we're doing. We're now what's called disciples. I don't think they probably use that language, but they said, wherever you're going, we're going. They were filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. This is how big the change was. Their reputation was, these that are coming here are the ones that have turned the world upside down. And they were, for the most part, just common people, just like you and I. But they were carrying the presence of God. All right. Third point, real change happens at a deep level. Turn to Psalm 139. You know, you need to read Psalm 139 more than just once a year, okay? Because it's just so good. 
because it's all about you, for the most part, you and God. And I'll give you a, a little illustration as we go along here um, in Psalm 139, but it starts off, it says, O Lord, thou hast searched me, and you've known me, and you know when I sit down and when I rise up, and you understand my thoughts from afar, and in fact, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Let's pause there for a second. That word scrutinize is the word that actually means to winnow out. You winnow out everything in my life in front of you. You can see it. You can see the chaff. You can see the wheat. You can see it all. You scrutinize the very path that I'm going on. In my lying down, you're intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you knew it already. And you've enclosed me behind and before, and you've laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is just too wonderful for me. It's too high. I can't even attain to it. And where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I could ascend up to heaven. You're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to thee. And the night is as bright as a day. Darkness and light are just alike to you. For thou dost form my inward parts. Thou dost weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We quote that all the time. I pray that over people. When you're praying for someone that's sick, pray these kind of things. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God gave you an immune system that's supposed to kick in and bring healing forth in your body. You're fearfully, wonderfully made. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. If anybody doesn't like what you look like, you say, look, I was skillfully wrought by God in the secret place in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Think about it. God has a book. It probably looks just like this one, because this is holy. And um, he just spent time, he has all eternity to work on it, writing all of his thoughts about you, all of his plans for you. In fact, how he was going to form you, what you would look like, what your voice would sound like how high you could jump, how fast you could run, you know, how soon your hair would get gray, how much hair you'd have left by the time you're 60 years old, 70, whatever. You know, all of these things were written in a book, where you'd live, how many kids you'd have, what challenges in life you might encounter. You know, I want to talk just for a second about the redemptive aspect of God we all know redemption. Jesus died on the cross. His blood covers our sins. He bought us back from whatever hell or whatever religious thing that we were living in, okay? And maybe if you get saved as a little kid, you didn't live in much hell or much religiousness. But nonetheless, you come to a place where you say, without God, I'm horrible. I'm a sinner. I am separated from him forever. And I need his love, I need his blood, I need the, what Jesus did on the cross. But this redemption, when the Bible says God so loved the whole world, that's not just world people, it's the word cosmos, and it means all the created order. He died to restore everything back into divine alignment with what he intended. Jesus is called the second Adam. The first Adam messed up. Jesus came as the second Adam so that we could step back into what the first Adam was supposed to be doing and leading and serving and tending the earth, taking dominion, multiplying, and all of those kind of things. So think of this. If you go down a wrong path, can God redeem that? What if you go down that wrong path for 40 years? Are you going to say, well, now forever my life is just wasted because I went down a, a path for 40 years? If I'd only gone down that path for a year, 
possibly God could have used me again. But because I went down that path five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, whatever, then I'll, you know, well, you're the one making that determination because God's love and his heart is redemptive. What it means is he buys it back. Your hurts, your failures, your sins, your missing the mark, all of that kind of stuff falls under this thing called redemption. He buys it back. He doesn't just buy it back and say, oh, that was tragic, and he sets it over there and say, wish you hadn't have done that. He throws it in the sea of his forgetfulness. No, he also uses it. He also buys it back and uses it. He restores it. He he puts it back into uh, his divine purpose. So I think God has an infinite number of things written in his book that could be possible for your life, okay? He's redemptive. All right, so hold that thought just for a second because this is so good. It says, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Let's just pause right there. So Psalm 139 is all about what God thinks about you and how at the very beginning, he's put all of these things, he's written them down, at least that's the imagery we get, and the thoughts that he has, just tremendous. We're going we're gonna to turn to Proverbs 20 here in just a minute. Um, let me get this other, th- yeah, there you go, you already have it. Real change happens at a deep level. At a very deep level, God created us, and I believe real change, real change happens at a deep level as well. It doesn't have to be the deep level of Jacob finally getting to the end of himself where he's totally poured out. That's what Jabok means, emptying out, where he has to wrestle. I love his passion and I love his tenacity and I think we need to learn something and adopt that. But it doesn't have to be a crisis for you and I to change. How many are happy about that? I don't always have to go through a crisis to change. I can do it out of desire. I can do it out of passion for God and who he is and passion for life and passion for a city or passion for an assignment that God gives us, all right? So Miles Monroe says this. He says, there are two things that are constant, time and change. It's always a new time, a new day, a new moment, And there's always change that's going on. Now, some of us don't like to change. Julie, you can come up here. We're going to close here in just a moment. Some of us don't like to change. We like it just the way we are. It is. We're insecure and all of that. But God wants us to change. And I'm going to give this as my closing right here. So he also goes on to say, man is the only creature Man is the only creature with the nature of God in him that can plan. Horses don't plan. Cows don't plan. Monkeys don't plan. You know, they may, you know, lions probably plan a little bit. They're going to go over here and crouch down and they're going to go, you know, go get the youngest deer they can find or whatever. There's there's probably those instinctive things. But this word right here... uh, The word for plan, it means design and purpose. And planning is all about changing. If I plan to go clean my shed, hopefully it won't look the same when I get done. I'm going to go do it so it can change because I don't like the way it is. Turn to Proverbs 20. This will be our closing scripture. It's just a few chapters away from where you are. Proverbs 20, and I want to give just a little example here. Verse 5, it says, A plan in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out. A plan in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding draws it out. Here's my, my, my little image. You know the Psalm 139, the, the thoughts that God has towards you? I've got this little bucket up here because you know if you draw something out of deep water 
you have to uh, have something to draw it out with. So let's say down in that deep water is the plans that God has for us, okay? And he knows exactly how he made us and all of that. So it's this image. Let me read it one more time. A plan in the heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding lets down his bucket and starts drawing it out. So the heart we know is usually in scripture is not just talking about your physical heart, it's talking about your spiritual man. So there's plans that a man has that God has put there down in your spirit, in your heart, okay? And, you know, we, we, we know about making plans with just our mind. If we're going on a trip, we start, you know, getting all the information together and, and all everything we're going to do. So we know about natural plans, but plans that go deep, that create change in who we are, that align us with God's purpose and start affecting things around us. Those plans and that change comes from a, a very deep level. Let me give you this progression real quick, because the word understanding is there. It says, a man of understanding draws it out. Well, does that mean I have to be super smart, super intelligent? No, I think the first understanding is that if I want change and I want to align with the purposes of God, I've got to start drawing it out of a deep place. A deep place, not just some shallow thought running through my mind, but it's coming out of a deep place. Many times you have had God speak to you in worship. You're in a deep place of worship, a deep place of prayer, and all of a sudden your heart is talking about one of your kids, about something you're supposed to do for someone else, a phone call, uh, something you need to repent of, a change. Where did it come out of? It came out of a deep place. So you go to that deep place. You reach in and, wow. I think God wants me to do this and this and this and this. And I think I'm being directed to do this or this or this. It comes out of that. It starts with understanding and then it goes to this, this thing of drawing. And let me just say, it's, it's all about the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit hovered over creation. And before the earth was even formed, it said it, it hovered over the waters. So. I think the same hovering Holy Spirit that was hovering over there hovers over these, and I know it's imagery, these deep waters that David is talking, or the psalmist is talking about, which would be Solomon, or the Proverbs, rather. That it's the Holy Spirit hovering. You can stand if you would, please. So it starts with that understanding, which I believe you know, is the Holy Spirit prompting you to say, if you want that change, you got to go deep for it. Doesn't, you know, there's a lot of scriptures about God being searched out. He wants to be found. He wants to be pursued. Understanding, drawing it out. It goes from the heart, then all of a sudden, those plans get clarified into my mind about what they are and then I can decide am I going to do it or not am I going to call that person am I going to explore that opportunity am I going to say yes to that assignment what is it that the Lord is, is directing in that my application I guess it's obvious let me get the last thing up there this is what I'm convinced of you and I must change I'm not rejecting anything of the past per se that God has spoken or done but alignment and affecting more things we have to go to a deep level 
And that deep level is just saying, you know what? I'm gonna put my life in front of God on a regular basis because he's written all of these things about me in his book. And I wanna find out what they are. And to do that, I'm gonna have to draw that out. In fact, I think I did have one more picture there. There, there's another picture. I gotta draw that out. And when I do, there'll be grace there, there'll be courage there, there'll be the Holy Spirit of God there, there'll be everything there that I need to do it. Amen? Amen. So the assignment this week is to go deep. Go ahead, lead us to it. Only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. some it's easier than others and you may say I feel stuck when I try to do this well I believe there's grace from God here today because I've spoken this message that you say okay Holy Spirit I know that you've written these plans for me and they're not hidden you're not trying to keep them from me but you want me to partner with you and the Holy Spirit to bring the plan for the moment the time that we're in to be in front of me so I can walk it out. You know, as we get good at that, it's exciting. It's when we stay away from doing that, we run from it or we ignore it, that life just keeps gnawing at us because we're supposed to be like Jacob, right in the middle of God's purpose, not running in fear from his brother or his uncle or any of that. Amen. We're supposed to be ascending into that new day. If you want prayer, somebody will be here and pray with you. Say, hey, I need to get unstuck in that area. I need my the lid taken off the well so I can draw down and pull from that deep water. Purposes of God. I'm going to pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, I just thank you that we're right here in the first day of September. We're not even waiting to January to say we're going to talk about change. Lord, change our hearts, change our mind, change our thinking. Lord, we're in a nation that's reeling with change right now. And Lord, we want to be rock solid in the changes in our life. We want to be those that have an answer to the culture. We want to be those that move into this new era, not of just seeing, but doing and speaking and declaring your kingdom and your will. I thank you for each person in here today, Lord, that as they open their Bible, as they step into their prayer time, as they worship, as they set their heart and mind on you, that there would just be this experience of deep calling unto deep and the drawing up, Lord, from that deep place, your purpose, your plan, 
the things that will cause us to change for your glory. And I thank you, Lord, that that's available to me and each one in here today. And we just declare over each one, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance towards you, give you peace. Amen. Have a great week, and if anyone wants prayer, just come down.